Hello. Probably many of you are working in a school right now, and I bet each of you could think of a time where a kid moved into your school and you weren't sure what to do, so you tried a reading intervention and it seemed to be successful. You don't know why it worked, it just did, and you don't really, it doesn't really matter. But then you have another kid who moves in who looks a lot like that other kid. And you think to yourself, wow, I had a kid like that before. I implemented an intervention, it worked. This is the same kind of problem, let's try that. And so you do, but this time it doesn't work. You ever stop to wonder why? My name is Matt Burns. I'm Associate Dean for Research at the University of Missouri and a professor in school psychology. I'm going to talk briefly this morning about using data to better target interventions. Part of the reason why I think interventions don't work, even though it's a research-based intervention that you've used before, is either we didn't implement it the right way, that might be true, but secondly, and the point of today is, because it probably didn't really match what the kid needed. I'm going to today, and I'm going to slide out of the way here so you can see some information rather than see me. I'm going to talk today about smarter small group reading interventions. Focusing on elementary school primarily, but certainly some information for high school as well. There are a lot of good reading interventions out there, and we tend to think of them as leading to proficient reading. I've listed several of them here, PALS, Peer Assisted Learning Strategies. A lot of people are using the uh, Level Literacy Intervention, etc. We think of them as leading to proficient reading, but that's actually based on flawed logic. I'll show you why I say that. I'm a big fan of the National Reading Panel and the work that they did. I'm going to take the phonemic awareness meta-analysis that they did. Remember they did a meta-analysis looking at phonemic awareness, phonics, uh, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension, and wanted to see how do interventions in those areas help kids learn how to read. I'm going to look at the one on phonemic awareness. Now the meta-analysis they did, as do most, and almost, well, most meta-analyses, use effect sizes. All you need to know, I love, I think effect sizes are so cool. I'll give you my email at the end of the, of the webinar. You can email me. I'll send you information. I'll be happy to talk to you more. But for now, all you need to know is a 0.8 means a good intervention. A 0.5 is a moderate intervention. And a 0.2 or so is, is a weak or a small, uh, a small effect, a weak intervention. Those, that's a standard deviation unit. So a 0.8 means the kids that got the intervention did 0.8 standard deviations better than the kids who didn't. Okay. They wanted to see this phonemic awareness and instruction help kids learn how to read, teaching kids that words are made of sounds, and we can manipulate those sounds, like uh, if you hear the word cat, and I say to a child, take the k in cat and make it a p, and what word do you have now? They looked at 52 studies of phonemic awareness and instruction, and they wanted to see this phonemic awareness help increase children's ability to manipulate phonemes, to spell, and to read. And they defined reading as any of these. If the study used word reading, pseudo word reading, uh, reading comprehension, etc., any of those they classified as reading. And what they found was that um, phonemic awareness instruction was effective with strong to moderate effects in reading and spelling. Trying to teach one or two was preferable than trying to teach three or more. So teaching blending and segmenting. Well, uh, and then teaching blending and segmenting together and maybe teaching manipulating is better than trying to teach all four at the same time. And it benefited reading comprehension. Now when this came out, this became huge news. And we were all of us who did research on interventions were really focusing heavily on phonemic awareness. And I was noticing that it was working, but certainly not all the time. So I became interested in that and went back to look at the studies more carefully. Now remember, this is your effect sizes, so 0.8 is a good intervention, or larger, 0.5 is moderate, and 0.2 is small. What we found was, if the study used pseudo-words, so reading um, nonsense words and other things like that, we saw differences. If the study used pseudo-words and wanted to see this phonemic awareness help kids learn how to read uh, word list type words, we saw effects of about 0.84, that's this column here which of course are large effects. Now, pseudo words are de you know, decodable nonsense words, but we also thought to ourselves, you know, there's more to reading than just that. 
And we think that those things that the National Reading Panel called reading, like word lists, um, pseudo words, trust criterion, comprehension, etc., those are all different. Related, but different. So pseudo words certainly led to a large effect if the, stu if the phonemic awareness did research with reading um, pseudo words, if the study did teaching phonemic awareness to teach words in isolation. Again, large effect. But if the study used actual contextualized reading, we saw a much smaller effect of about 0.37, which led us to, to conclude, when should you do a phonemic awareness intervention? The answer, when the child doesn't have phonemic awareness. I'm really skeptical about comprehensive interventions. And I stop thinking of these things as leading to proficient reading, and I think of them instead as leading to very specific skills. And I use the framework of the National Reading Panel to classify those skills. Our task is to find out in which skill the kid struggles and which intervention then addresses that skill. So in essence, what we do is we, once a child identifies a struggling reader, we go in more deeply to figure out what's going on. We assess phonemic awareness with phoneme segmentation fluency, for example, but there are other ways. The comprehensive test of phonological processing has a nice phonemic awareness measure in it. Phonics, certainly you could use nonsense word fluency. The Dibbles, Ames, Webb, nonsense word fluency. The Woodcock, Johnson, pseudo word subtest certainly measures decoding and uh, phonics. Fluency, oral reading fluency, I'll talk about this measure in just a second, but oral reading fluency, oral reading fluency is a good indicator of overall reading skills. But those data should not be too overinterpreted. It's just an indicator of reading, but it also will tell you if a child can read with rate and accuracy. And then lastly, measures of vocabulary and comprehension, measures of academic progress, uh, star reading, etc., are good measures of comprehension. So we work backwards. We start with a screener. And if they're low in comprehension, for example, we give every kid star, for example. If they're low on that, then for those kids, we might screen their oral reading fluency. Now, many schools already do this together, so that's a lot of the data you need right there. If they're low in uh, comprehension, but have good fluency, we start with comprehension. If they're low in comprehension, low in fluency, then we screen decoding skills. If they're low, low, but have good decoding, we focus on fluency to start with. If comprehension is low, fluency is low, and decoding is low, then we look at phonemic awareness. If they're low here, here, and here, but have good phonemic awareness, our intervention focuses on decoding. If they're low on all four, we focus on phonemic awareness, because that's as low as you can go. Let me show you some examples of this and some studies we've done. This is a study we did with uh, high school kids. Oh, I'm sorry. First of all, this is when we do, a, do this research and work at schools, we basically develop a menu that looks like this, that has that has the skill across the top and the grade across the, the side here, and basically create a menu. So if they're in um, fourth grade and struggle with decoding, we give them the rewards intervention. Whereas if they're in second grade and struggle with fluency, they get six minute solution. And we teach our schools, our teachers, to simply look at the data, pull out this menu, and select from it. So standardized tier two interventions doesn't mean every kid gets the same intervention. It does mean every intervention is research-based, but also the intervention should match the deficit for which the child is struggling. Again, let me show you some examples. This is a high school we worked with, and a high school in Minnesota that wanted us to uh, help them develop a Tier 2 intervention system. So we worked with them, and they had a remediation course, but the remediation course essentially just ran a book club for their struggling readers. So we came in and worked with these kids. There are about 1,600 kids, 9th through 12th grade. We worked with only the juniors, I'm sorry, freshmen and sophomores. So the 9th and 10th grade. 69% passed the state test in reading in 9th and 10th grade. We started with the um, MAP. In this school, they used MAP as the universal screener. Now, MAP is the measures of academic progress, for those of you, those of you who aren't familiar with it. It's developed by the Northwest Evaluation Association. It's a fine screening measure, especially for kids in high school, middle school. 
Star is a good one for that. Uh, for younger kids, we usually start with oral reading fluency. So for this kid, these, this group of kids, we started with the map. Among these 9th and 10th graders, about 225 of them, or roughly 28%, were low on the map. We're not done for those kids. For those 225, we then screened them with a, a fluency measure. Now we searched to find a fluency measure because our high school teachers were hesitant to do one-on-one -on -one oral reading fluency screening with these uh, 225 kids. So we found a group administered measure of reading fluency. The test of silent contextual reading fluency. Published by ProEd, it's a fine measure, there are certainly others, the test of word reading efficiency comes to mind. But we assessed those kids, it's a group administered measure of fluency, and for times I can't explain it in enough detail, but there's certainly information online that you could find if you Googled it. So the, we gave those 225 kids the, 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 task, the task of silent contextual reading fluency. About 100 kids, 45% of those 225 kids scored low on the, on the t test on the reading fluency measure. Which means 125 kids were low in comprehension, but had fine fluency skills. Those 125 kids got a comprehension intervention. Now those 100 kids were still not done. For those kids, we pull them all out one-on-one -on -one and did the Woodcock-Johnson Word Attack subtest. It takes just about a minute per kid. I don't know of a group administered decoding test. If someone knows, I'd love to hear about it. But for those 100 kids, we screened them with the, with the uh, 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 Woodcock-Johnson pseudo-word reading subtest, Word Attack. About, well, I'll start this. About a third of them, or so, had good decoding skills. So those kids were low in comprehension, low in fluency, but good decoding. For those kids, we targeted fluency. And then lastly, about 65 of these kids were low on decoding, which I find alarming, but not surprising, because I see it all the time. But 65 ninth and 10th graders in general education couldn't code to a basic level, couldn't decode. So those kids got a decoding intervention. Now we don't screen phonemic awareness in high school because there aren't going to be any high school kids without disabilities who lack phonemic awareness. We then randomly assigned a couple of groups. Uh, they either got rewards, uh, I'm sorry, no, they got READ 180. READ 180 is a fine intervention. It's expensive, it's a comprehensive intervention. So we're comparis comparing is it better to target it or to use something that addresses fluency, comprehension, and a little bit of decoding all in one. So Read 180 was our control group. The targeted kids got rewards for phonics, read naturally for fluency, and then comprehension pieces of Read 180 for the kids that needed comprehension. So no kid got all of these. Every kid just got one of these if they were assigned to the targeted group. We also had a weightless control. Too many kids for us to work with. So we had a weightless control. 20 minutes a day, 13 weeks, in addition to reading and study skills, we did a targeted or comprehensive intervention. And then what we found was that our kids in pretest looked a lot alike. So in the pretest, our targeted kids versus the Read 180 kids. Scores were at the lowest extreme of the average range, about a standard score of 90, 25th percentile. After doing the, po the intervention, the kids that got the target intervention, the rewards, uh, the read naturally or the comprehension part of read 180, went up to 98.3, over eight standard score points. The read 180 kids went up by about five standard score points, which is were quite good too. But this was a significant, for fluency, the kids that got the intervention, the, the tailored intervention, the targeted, got a, a significantly stronger effect and a moderate effect. For MAP, these are RIT scores. I'm not going to explain what the, the scale for RIT, which I don't because I don't have time, but in pretest, 206, 211, and now our weightless control comes into play with our with their score of 210. We did the intervention, and you can see these went up by ele over 11 standard score points, up by a little over one, up by a little over two. A significant and large effect. Targeting the intervention was more effective than giving the kids a good research-based comprehensive intervention. And we've replicated this a, several, a few times. Here's one with a group of 600 kids. I'm going to do this fairly quickly in elementary school. But this time, instead of using Read 180 as our control group, we used the level literacy intervention. 
And what we see, what we found is, I hope you can see this okay, is that the kids that got the targeted intervention grew at, in second and third grade, 1.33, 1.23 words per minute per week, which was significantly larger growth than kids that got the comprehensive intervention, 1.07 and 0.94, and even more than tier one, kids who had no reading problems before we began, 1.25 and 1.03. So the kids that got the targeted intervention grew at a faster rate than the LLI kids, the comprehensive kids, but also a faster rate than the kids who had no reading problems before we began, which means that we successfully at least closed the gap and it was a significant effect. We did a meta-analysis as well, remember 0 0.8, 0 0.5, 0 0.2. Uh, we found average effect sizes for interventions, small group interventions of 0.5. But one thing we noticed was that if it was targeted, focusing on just one area in which the kid struggled, 13 effects did that, 0.65. Comprehensive, addressing all of them together, a much smaller effect at 0.26, which means targeting intervention is more effective. <clears throat> so remember, if the kids have low comprehension but good fluency, really focus on a comprehensive comprehension intervention. Now that doesn't mean you won't do some decoding, some word skill. No, of course. Just like you do a fluency or decoding intervention, you'll always have some sort of comprehension component built in. But that's a quick aspect of it. And honestly, if you're spending more than 20 minutes on intervention per day, you're probably doing more instruction than intervention, which is a point I'll come back to in just a minute. So low comprehension, good fluency, do a comprehension intervention. Low comprehension, low fluency, but good decoding, focus on fluency. Low comprehension, low fluency, and low decoding, but good phonemic awareness, focus on decoding. If they're low on all of them, then focus on phonemic awareness. A quick shortcut, for time's sake, I can't explain all the research behind this, but you probably already have the data you need to really look at some of these things. If you're doing oral reading fluency, take the words read correctly per minute and look at those errors per minute. Now I always struggle with how to use errors per minute because in my opinion errors per minute are meaningless data. If a kid makes five errors while reading a hundred words, that means something very different than five errors while reading 20 words. So I take those errors. Let's say a kid reads 45 words per minute, correct per minute, plus five errors. Well, 45 plus five is 50. 45 words per minute divided by 50 is 90. The kid reads 90% of the words correctly. You want to use 93% as your criterion. Children who are reading less than 93% of the words correctly are struggling to decode, the, to decode, struggling to break the code of the text, usually. And so this will be hard for you to see, I'm sorry, so I'll just quickly give some examples. Uh, a child here reading 50 words a minute with 96% correct and a child reading 57 words per minute with 88% of the words read correctly probably need two different interventions. So if a child is low on the comprehension, which is this RIT score here, the first percentile, 57 words per minute, which I don't know what the criterion is, but let's say it's 65, 93%, 17, uh, RIT score of 17, 58, 92%, you know, versus the kid, ninth percentile, 57 words a minute, 88% correct. The child is reading 88% of the words correctly is probably struggling to break the code. I'm going to focus on decoding for that kid. Whereas a kid at the 37th percentile for comprehension, 54 words a minute, 95% correct, I'm probably going to do some word building, fluency building activities with that kid. These are hypotheses. They, they don't always work out as we plan, but for most of the kids, starting with these data, analyzing the data you probably already have, can give you a pretty good indication of where to start. And we use a form, I highly recommend it. Um, this is from the Press Intervention, the Path to Reading Excellence in School Sites, which is a project with which I was affiliated for uh, uh, three years. Uh, if you Google Path to Reading Excellence in School Sites, you can find information, or Google the Minnesota Center for Reading Research. But we give this to our teachers, they fill it in, and basically what it looks like is this. We, the teachers sit down, look at the data, and say, while well, this kid's reading, um, 41 words correct per minute with five errors, 89%, that's a decoding intervention. Whereas this kid's reading 58% of the words correctly, 94%, that's probably going to be a fluency intervention. And for time's sake, I'll just repeat what you just saw, basically. Now, in conclusion, 
move this back a little bit now. <clears throat> so in conclusion, a couple of things to keep in mind. You can target the intervention by isolating a deficit skill, as we've talked about with assessment data, including just looking at accuracy within orbit fluency metrics. Use existing data to, to look at the accuracy and match intervention to skill deficit. In doing so, we see stronger effects. But all of that is dependent on good core instruction. In order to pull reading apart and focus on what the kid needs, they have to be, it has to be being put back together someplace else, which means good core instruction. Without good core instruction, this will not work. And without good core instruction, interventions are not effective. Without good core instruction, nothing else matters. But with a, simply, a simple approach to look at data you probably already have, and occasionally collecting a little extra data, you can have interventions that lead to stronger effects and have smarter interventions. My email is burnsmk, Burns M as in Matt, K as in Kevin, burnsmk at missouri.edu. Please email me if you have any questions. I would be happy to talk about these further. I hope you enjoyed this and found some useful information in it. Thank you.